All right, I have a guy that wants to talk with me that works for a mainstream media company that I don't want to say because he wants to remain somewhat anonymous. All right, Dad, what's up? All right. Well, um, I suppose to start off and sort of just introduce myself and my credentials. So as you tweeted out and as you may have said on stream, I am a mainstream media journalist. It's fair to describe me as early career. Okay. I am a GA reporter, which is a general assignment for those not in the know. That said, I do have a focus on agencies that enforce immigration, let's say. So that would be ICE, CBP, the U.S. Border Patrol, etc. Um, I also write about security issues related to cybersecurity primarily. Okay. All right. So really what I want to talk to you about, I guess media responsibility is a good way to put it. And jumping off that, I just want to ask you, do you consider yourself to be part of the media? Yeah, of course. I think so. I think everybody that has an audience is to some extent. Um, obviously, I don't consider myself to be on the level of, um, you know, like CNN or Fox News or, uh, you know, any massive channel. But everybody with an audience to some extent, you know, is responsible for digesting and then disseminating information. So. Sure, sure, sure. Now, given that, how much thought do you really give to the associated responsibilities of, you know, being in the media? A lot. A lot? You yeah. want to take me through some of those? Um. Well, I mean, it. Uh, or I mean, like, what part? I mean, there's a lot of different things to th that can kind of go. Do you want me to just, like, talk a little bit, or? Yeah, just talk a little bit. That's fine. Um. I think that to some extent, I think that uh, th there's a very hard line that you have to walk when you're a content creator or when you have an audience because to some extent... Uh, whether it's right or wrong or should or shouldn't exist, there are people that will parrot what you say and will take on the beliefs that you have. That is an undeniable fact of life, and to ignore that makes you either incredibly naive or, or willfully stupid. I don't know, which, whichever you want to be. Um, so knowing that, you must acknowledge that the way that you um, conduct yourself will be imitated and emulated by people that watch you. So I think that everything you do... Um, needs to be guided by that so to, to, to make a real life example um, any any value that I espouse on stream would be a value that I would hope that most people would share um, and I wouldn't pretend to do something stupid or or um, cherish or value something that that is highly detrimental um, so like I wouldn't say that like um, you know oh I think it's really funny to go out and shoot guns in the street all the time um, and no one's ever gotten hurt but it's like really funny to do it like I always point my gun in the air so that nobody gets shot and it's really fun like I wouldn't say that because I would I would believe that I have a I've got some degree of responsibility as a content creator to understand that people will do what I say um, you know for better or for worse so um, I mean, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is the the, the, um, the dissemination of information, right? I consume information, and then after I consume that information, um, what we'll say related to current events or politics, um, I need to develop an opinion on it, right? What I say to people is is the same as any pundit on Fox News or any person um, you know on YouTube when I when I tell somebody my opinion on a story I'm giving them a digested version that they are going to regurgitate without reading the original story I know that's going to happen that's just a fact of life so I have a responsibility to my audience assuming that I value truth I have a responsibility to my audience to give them the truest version of whatever story I read with as little bias or as little bullshit as possible because I value being um, you know factually correct or value being um, somebody that is you know trying to ultimately seek and disseminate truth rather than just biased media narratives or whatever or biased political narratives well I'm very glad to hear all that and I do have to say, just um, I have seen some of your previous arguments in part. I mean, I don't have really the time to sit through like the two hour spiel yeah, I know of you arguing with someone who's intellectually dishonest. It's just not, you know, worth it for me, though. I do enjoy them. I, I want to make that clear. <laughs> and you do to me at least reflect to a degree. And I say a degree because there are all sorts of limits on new mediums and new mediums are different from legacy media and even new media quote unquote in the terms that it's used in the industry mm -hmm. um, but moving on from that I kind of just want to jump back to the intellectually dishonest bit so why do you argue with these people um, I have like um I have like a big meme that I kind of discovered a few years ago um, I, I think the way that I, t I said it was like perception is reality um, I, I guess as human beings 
uh, this is a little philosophical, but as human beings, we interpret the environment around us with our five senses or eight or 13 or however many are actually right. But, but we interpret the environment around us. We process that information in our brain. And then however we see the world, that is how the world is, um, full stop. Um, truth and our perception of the truth could be two entirely different things. But at the end of the day, the perceptions are the only thing that matter. Um, if I walk into a room, um, a completely innocent man, but every single person in that room thinks that I, you know, I'm a child rapist, then for all intents and purposes, I am a child rapist. I'm going to experience life as a child rapist. I will be treated as such. Um, you know, maybe violence will be used against me, or I'll be locked up in jail or executed or whatever. Right. So the perception is really important. Um, I'm sorry. Perception is the most important thing. It is more important than 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 fact or truth. So. My goal when I see people having conversations, when I'm having conversations, is to try to move perception as close to truth as possible. There are many people, um, especially online and in new media, that have become these massive pillars of, of, of political discussion and discourse on, on, on the internet. People like Sargon Abakat, people like Stefan Molyneux, um, Molyneux, whatever his name is, right? These, these people that, you know, as you say, engage in intellectual dishonesty. If millions of people listen to these people and they think that everything they say is true, then for all intents and purposes to these people, that is truth. So I think that I, I, I would like to dispel as much of that as possible, however much I can, you know, being the, the size of a figure I am, obviously I'm not, you know, the biggest guy on YouTube or even in streaming these days. So, um, yeah, but I feel like if enough of, if enough people believe in this kind of stuff, I think you have to address it. You can't just ignore it and expect that at the end of the day, people will come around because I'm obviously, if you look at where we're at today in the United States, it's not, necessarily going to happen so i think you have to address arguments even if they seem like they're made in bad faith even if they seem like they're coming from people that don't care about the truth you have to address you have to present your side um in, in order to give people a chance to, to hear it out you know well i'm glad to hear that we're both don quixote and that we're both fighting a good fight <laughs> yeah. past that do you really think your audience is you know smart enough I'm trying to think of how to phrase this smart enough to either know the difference between what's bullshit and what isn't or smart enough to recognize when they're being fed a line. Um, are you, fam and so, I mean, I, I don't want to put you on the spot with, you know, having to trash your audience or not. Oh no, air. I'll trash them. I'll trash them. Yeah. If they if they say stupid shit, I'm very honest with my audience. So, <laughs> um, are you familiar with like, um, have you ever been in any type of therapy for like a, a mental problem or emotional problem or some kind of psychiatric, psychiatric disorder or anything like that? Or, or are you familiar with the process of that? I was depressed in high school, but I never sought professional help. Okay. So, I am familiar with the process. To okay. Agree. Okay. So this is kind of, this is my familiar, familiarity with it is only what I learned in psych, right? The way that it was described to me as, is when you see a therapist, the therapist doesn't try to make you undepressed or cure you of your, um, you know, mental ailment or whatever. That's not their goal. What the therapist does is the therapist tries to give you tools so that when you are experiencing these negative thoughts, you have a tool set that you can reach into to counteract that. So um, let's say that you have a problem with um, your self-worth. Let's say that you have very, very, very low self-esteem and this manifests in a whole bunch of negative ways in your life, right? Maybe the therapist isn't, you don't go to the therapist for him to tell you like, oh no, you're worth a lot. You're really good, right? You go to the therapist so that he can give you tools so that anytime you start to experience these thoughts um, he will give you a different way of dealing with these thoughts so that they don't um, they, they aren't detrimental to your life right so when I talk to my audience I, I guess maybe I don't do this well enough but I try to I don't try to tell my audience like this is what you need to think about this thing you need to think that immigration is good you need to think that immigration is bad I, I know that I know that some people might walk away with that opinion but what I try to do is I try to give my audience um, my thought process or my tools or my understanding of something so that they understand that the issues are nuanced so that they come away so, so like if anybody's ever heard me talk about globalism or immigration I want them to come away from that conversation not thinking that, oh, yeah, immigration is really good. Globalization is really good. But rather thinking that, okay, there are pros and cons to every single issue. Um, Destiny thinks that the pros outweigh the cons here. But even if I go away knowing that, I can still be cognizant of the cons here. Because there are too many people that believe in a certain thing. Um, we'll say Hillary Clinton, for example, you know, espoused the greatness of globalism all the time, but refused to acknowledge any of the, the downsides to it, which led to the Democrats losing, you know, a lot of white people voting for them, a lot of working class white people that ended up, uh, um, you know, not voting for them because of the loss of jobs you know that that impacted certain sections of the united states mm -hmm. you know yeah uh, so. i have to, to countermand you a little bit there there's a lot of stuff that went on during the campaigns mm -hmm. that i mean certainly that had an effect to a degree but 
there was a lot of stuff with how the media campaigns ran, and by that I mean how advertising campaigns ran. Sure, there might so there might there might be. A, I'm not trying to pin this on any single sure. thing, but when Bernie got up, um, th so in my uh, we're side something a little bit, but like in my opinion, one of the big things about this election and in almost across the Western world, uh, but but especially in the United States, anti-establishment um, sentiments were a massive thing, and recognizing. The, the recognizing that some people have been left behind by globalist policies. I believe this is a big part of Brexit as well. There have been losers. I think that both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders acknowledged that there were losers. Bernie did it with his 1% rhetoric. Um, Bernie did it when he talked about trade deals destroying jobs in America. Bernie recognized that those people had lost. Trump, in whatever insane fucking rhetoric Trump has, he acknowledged that some people felt left behind as well. Hillary, in her attempt to counteract Trump's campaign, Trump said, make America great again. Hillary's slogan was like, America is already great, or let's keep America great. It was this relentless optimism that, while largely was based in reality, failed to acknowledge that some people were left behind. Now, again, I'm not saying that's the sole reason why Hillary lost. I understand that this was a very close election, and there were a million and one reasons why one side might have won or lost, but I do think that was a, a part of it to some extent, I think. Oh, no, no, no. And I, I would definitely, definitely agree with that. That 100% was a part. Your messaging is basically almost everything in politics and mm -hmm. in campaigns especially. Yeah. But again, I just want to stress just for the chat, there were a lot of things that happened in the campaign that all had various levels of effects. But oh, yeah. as you said, we are getting a little bit sidetracked. <laughs> sure. I, uh, back when the campaign was going on, I actually worked in TV, so I did that almost exclusively for a few months. I'm so sorry. I wanted to kill myself just watching it on stream. Jesus. Jesus. Do you, do you want to know how many Trump and Hillary rallies I've seen? I don't know. Did you have to go to any of them? No, I was working from New York, but holy shit, dude. Yeah. Untenable. Yeah. Like, I could probably quote them to you right now. I'm not going to, but sure. oh god. All right, but... So, I mean, you addressed a lot of the possible questions that I had early on, which mm -hmm. is good because we can move into the sort of more... I don't know how to phrase this. Let's say, let's say confrontational. I don't want to be confrontational, but that's just kind of how it's going to turn out. As long as you don't scream at me. Yeah. Professional. I don't scream at people. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so... Argument that you put out... I don't, I don't even want to say argument, but mm -hmm. the point you put out earlier about arguing with these people that do have large audiences is very valid. Yes, you do have to contramand that. And again, I'm glad we're both Don Quixote different when you're arguing with these randoms that see your debates let's say with what was it sargon or whoever else and they come onto your screen stream and then you talk to them i do want to note you are or at least you i feel like attempt is a little bit too it's not generous enough for the situation but you know you attempt to be respectful but to some degree these people are private citizens that are putting themselves into the spotlight and essentially exposing them to a level of shaming and i mean w without drawing winners and losers i'm going to say that generally because you do this more often you come out on top so effects that that can have on these people in terms of the mob mm -hmm. are you talking about like like people you want to take me through this are you talking about do you want me to talk about like people hunting these people down not like literally but like trying to dox people or harass people or i doxing I feel like is a little bit too I mean doxing is certainly a concern but I feel like that's one of the rare occurrences I'm, I might be wrong there mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah that sort of stuff in general so I am I am I am relentless in the way that I approach issues like this and I feel like my message has been consistent across the six or seven years I've been streaming um, I have never in my life been in favor of hurting anybody's job or hurting anybody's reputation or hurting anybody in any way because of some kind of political opinion that they have. Um, even when um, even when JonTron was, was dropped as a voice actor from that whatever game, which wasn't even really a big deal, I was very much against that. I didn't want to see him lose any fan. I'm big on separating the art from the artist, you know? Um, I, I'm, I'm very, very consistent with all of that, and I try to be um, a lot of times because of this. To my knowledge, and you can correct me if I'm wrong if you know something that I don't, to my knowledge, I don't think my fans have ever, like, gone out of the way to try to, like, mess with somebody that I've had a debate with. Um, the 
the only thing I can think of that will happen is maybe on that particular day, people will kind of, you know, shit talk them on Twitter. But I, but I'm pretty sure that after like a day or maybe two, if it was a really big talk, that dies down completely. I've never heard of somebody like going out of their way like, oh, you debated Destiny? Well, I'm going to fuck you up now, kid. You know, like anything like that. Okay. And no, I haven't heard of any specific instances. This is almost purely hypothetical. Mm -hmm. on, but... on, on, on speaking to that, though, you bring up a mm -hmm. very valid point, um, because I do believe that there are people that engage in that type of behavior. And I think that there are people that don't do enough to stop it. Um, let me give you a quick example. I am very much against violence period, politically, ever. I do not think that it should be used in, in the United States of America. And I will All extend right, we're going to talk about that later. Sure, but, but, but I'll, I'll extend that to everybody, including Richard Spencer, right? Um, I don't think that somebody like that should be assaulted in the street ever, right? And I'm very clear on that. There is no... You, you, you cannot listen to me talk about this and come away thinking that I'm ever okay with that, right? And a lot of people on the right, the alt-right, the new right, whatever the fuck you want to call it, the liberal people that say, or the people that say they're liberal but are really right, like, a lot of these people, you know, join me in saying that, like, oh, yeah, Destiny, you're absolutely right, like, yeah, 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 right? Which is good. That's the message we should be sending. However, just recently, there was an Antifa rally, um, and, and a bunch of people, there, there was that video of that one dude punching that one girl. Do you remember? Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a lot of, you know, dipshits like Sargon are tweeting things like, well, this is what happens when you come to a fight and you start fighting like, oh, well, that's what happens. Well, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, OK, like you're giving a very, very different message now than you were before. So if you give these types of messages out, right, it, it wouldn't surprise me. And I don't want to say it's your fault, but if your fans were ever at some type of political rally and they decided to go out and fight somebody or punch somebody because they deemed them to be violent, to some extent, that's kind of on you. Like, I don't want to say it's entirely your fault, but I mean, like, look at how you're acting. Like, so, do you, do you understand? Like, that's kind of my example. So I do agree with you that, like, you, you do have yeah. some responsibility. I try my hardest to make sure that I, I'm constantly telling people that it is unacceptable to witch hunt somebody, to ruin their career, to threaten their job, to harass them. I do not ever, ever, I don't even, um, you know, like, say, like, oh, you guys should go find his job, huh? but not really, but really do it. You know, like, I never even say that kind of shit because I, I'm really opposed to that kind of stuff. I'm glad to hear, and I do just want to point out, there is a level of legal vi liability with that sort of incitement. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have heard or read about this, but Trump the is Trump. being sued. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, he should, yeah, he should be, dude. Happens. He literally said he would pay for the fucking... He's going to end up taking the Alex Jones defense. You know that, right? Where he's like, oh, no, I'm just an entertainer. I was just kind of joking. Like, I didn't really mean that. It's fucking stupid. Oh, a judge, a judge would not accept that argument with a public official. I hope it's, not. It's different when... To some degree, people can consider Alex Jones an entertainer because I'm sure some people find that entertaining. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that once you're in government, that just doesn't work. Like, you can be a public figure and that's different, but being a public official has its own weight. Yeah, and that I absolutely now, think Trump should should take, take liability for that because he unequivocally encouraged that type of violence at his events. Yeah, just for the record. Mm -hmm. but... Yeah, so... Just to kind of segue, just because my questions are a little bit fucked. Mm -hmm. uh, so, hit pieces. I've heard you speak about, I mean, I've seen you watch these, <laughs> and I, I'm going to use the hit pieces because it's your term, or and it's the term that gets thrown around in your discussions and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but first, how does it make you feel when people make you, or make these about you? Um, I guess it's usually, my feelings are usually just of disappointment. <laughs> um... <laughs> I guess um I like I've been I'm I have a very particular type of personality. I'm I'm a pretty cold person in real life. I don't I'm not usually uh, emotionally affected by very many things. Um aside from literally like my son, I can't think of very many things that have a, a great emotional impact on me. Um j I don't know for for whatever reasons we, why we why are we the things we are. So I mean like I, I mean I've been on the internet for a long time. So I don't I'm not like emotionally distraught if that's kind of what you're getting at when I see people make things about me. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I don't go to mm -hmm. be crying at night. Um it, it is very irritating to me on an intellectual level because I had a, a lot of conversations about a lot of topics that had a great deal of substance to them you know with Sargon we're talking about you know issues in the black community we're talking about the agency of people to, to act freely you know free of their environment we're talking about immigration we're talking about Brexit we're talking about a lot of heavy topics and same thing with John Tron we were talking about matters of race cultural and ethnic identity um, you know the uh, nationalism um, the right to protect your country the sacrificing of an economy for a culture like there are a lot of really heavy topics here so when somebody comes out and makes a 15-minute video in response to that, as so many videos were, 
and all of them are just random personal attacks on me. I guess it's a little bit annoying that I go through the effort of, of, of being as well read, I guess, as I can be on some of these topics. And then I come out the other end with people calling me a pedophile and a communist. And it's like, OK, well, that seems a little bit silly. It's also very disappointing to me on another level, because largely the rise of this quote unquote, and it leaves a bad taste, I must say it, the skeptic community on YouTube. The rise of these people was largely in response to SJWs that engaged in the same type of character assassination warfare. So to see it happen on the other side with Richard Lewis, with Sargon, with people just making these really absurd claims about me, you know, not like, wow, Destiny. Um, Destiny's so dumb because he thinks that the uh, that the trade-off of free labor in the country is worth the uh, depression and wages of, of people in the United States who are high school dropouts. That'd be, that'd be a legitimate criticism to levy at me. But instead, it's Destiny. Oh, that guy wants to invade Mexico, and he's a communist. Like... Okay, I mean, I haven't really said either of those things, but sure. It's 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 depressing to see the side engage in that when that side was kind of created as a response to people that do that to people on their side, you know? Now, I mean, can you really expect anything else? Because you know they're intellectually <laughs> dishonest going into these. I don't know, dude. Um, every year of my life, I, how old are you? I'm 22. I turned 22 today, actually. Oh, gotcha. I'm 28. I don't know. I lose more faith in people every day. So maybe maybe now I don't expect it. Maybe I expect more now. Maybe in five years, if you ask me that, I'll expect less. I don't know. Well, all right. Now, <laughs> you've also <laughs> you've also used the term hit piece in the context of the uh, Wall Street Journal article on, what was it, PewDiePie? Yeah. You want to take me through your thinking on that? Because that, I feel like, is something that we're going to disagree on. Um, I, so I guess, um, I got into an argument with a guy in my chat and I read this article a few weeks ago. Um, the first one that they'd put out, I guess that, um, I don't know. It just, he, so here's a problem. Here's a problem that I've had, um, growing up. The PewDiePie situation is near and dear to me because I've experienced this kind of similar stuff. Um, there, so there's a distinction you can make, right? I think that. I think that you can say racist things without being racist. I think you can say homophobic things without being homophobic. So um, let me give a, let me give a further example of this. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this or how long you've been a follower of me or whatever, but a long time ago I used to say faggot very, very frequently. It was like a staple. Yeah, word. I mean, but mm -hmm. that is something that's very common with the video game industry and opinions on that, let's say, have changed very, very drastically within the last few years. And I noticed that, mm -hmm. I don't know when you stop, I shouldn't make that very clear, but I sure. noticed that you do not use that anymore. Sure. And I don't because of a personal revelation I had. I don't really care much about the common whatever. It's generally, mm -hmm. I try to be as consistent with myself as possible, right? Um, I had a personal revelation um, when talking to some people and I realized that I just didn't want to say it anymore. But the problem was leading up to that point, um, if people would have incur if people would have approached me and said, Destiny, when you use the word faggot, um, even if you don't mean to, you unintentionally can encourage homophobia. Like, there are ways to it, blah, blah, blah. Now, there are some people that said this, but it's very, very, very few people actually said that. But instead, people would say, Destiny, oh, he's homophobic. Oh, Destiny, he's a homophobe, right? Or if you would say uh -huh. certain things like, oh, you know, like, oh, he's a racist. He's a homophobe, right? It would just be these massive blanket statements. And it's like, well, damn, is that really true? Because I feel like when you when you make statements like this, and this is what all of my stream is about, is having the right conversation, right? When you make statements like that, like, is that, I don't think, I'm not a racist. I've never been a racist. And and you no legitimate person would ever call me a racist. Now, could you argue that I have said or done things that could contribute to a climate of racism or homophobia? Absolutely. You absolutely could. And I would probably even agree with some of those arguments like this that's undeniable right or my, i use the word autistic a lot right you can make arguments that doing so denigrates people with mental illness right in a negative way um there are lots of legitimate arguments being there my problem with the pewdiepie hit piece was that um it, it just it felt like instead of saying that like um I, I don't know instead of instead of being of the mindset that maybe using anti-semitic remarks um you know could contribute to a climate blah 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 blah, blah it was more like pewdiepie is literally a nazi that's kind of how it came off to me mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing to consider, and you mm -hmm. can mistake me if I'm, or you can correct me if I'm mistaken on the numbers here. But PewDiePie was what the largest YouTube channel like in existence at that point. Yes, still, it still is, yeah. Still is. Well, well I think so. Yeah. All right. Well, let's just go out on a limb and say that's the definition of mainstream. Would you agree with that? Um, what do you mean by mainstream? Well, I mean the idea behind mainstream is audience size, correct? Okay. Yeah, that's sure. He's got he's got a massive audience. To to this. Yeah, sure. He's got yeah. a massive audience. Sure. Now, we talked about responsibility in media, and mm -hmm. I think you would agree that he is a member of the quote-unquote media. And for, first, before we go any further, I just want to address this. 
uh, to the people in chat. I'm using media here as a monolith for the you know purposes of this intellectual exercise. Media, quote unquote, is not a thing. Outlets are different to each other, so on and so on, and continue. Or was I making a point? Wait, yeah, you were making I a point. Making you point. were talking about okay. PewDiePie is a very, very large figure in media, right? Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. So at this point, he, like I do, so when I covered the elections, I had a responsibility to cover the elections because they were the most important thing going on in America, period, full mm -hmm. stop. Sure. Now, he, as a member of the quote-unquote mainstream media, shares a similar responsibility and I feel like it's a responsibility that, I mean, you understand because we you said it earlier. Mm -hmm. Now, there appears to me to be a certain lack of responsibility when someone with that size, or with an audience of that size, spreads these beliefs, even in jest. And I mean, we can discuss whether or not he's racist. He may or may not be. I don't watch him. Um, but. At, essentially a line gets drawn at some point once your audience reaches a certain size and what you say is what you are. Do you understand? Or do you understand where I'm coming from, rather? Oh, I understand completely, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, given that, does, like, does... How does that play into your view of the situation? So what you're talking about now, this is exactly the kind of stuff I'm, I'm talking about. This is, an, is a fascinating conversation. Um... What is the responsibility of a content creator to his audience? I think that a piece about that, um, you know, should PewDiePie be using any type of anti-Semitic humor or is that not acceptable, you know, of somebody with an audience of his size rather than just saying that PewDiePie is exhibiting anti-Semitic behavior or whatever? Like, do, do you... Do you kind of understand like the difference? Like, I think that it's interesting to have the conversation on what is the responsibility to, to your audience, especially when you're talking about new media and people on the mm -hmm. internet who are in mm -hmm. in a in an un unexplored territory. Um, I, I just I feel like those conversations are more fruitful than just labeling somebody anti-Semitic. And and just um, just as an example, like we've we've kind of foregone this, where both you and I kind of agree that content creators have a responsibility to the audience. This is something that not everybody agrees on. This is a very hotly contested idea, you know? Um, uh, and exa examples that I always give, um, because I thought they were so fascinating, because I, I started reading about these after I had made the same kind of decision on not to say faggot anymore, or at least as little as possible, um, trying to say never. Um, is that there are other content creators that have gone through these similar struggles in the past. Dave Chappelle, um, Chris Rock, Louis C.K. have all had these struggles where they've had very specific acts that had elements of racial or homophobic humor involved in them. And then they realized afterwards that they didn't want to continue doing that kind of humor because there were people that were um, there were people that were listening to it and finding, I guess, comfort in it that they didn't want to listen to it and think they had an ally with them and, and you know like are you yeah, yeah no th yeah there's that classic example of the um the chris rock bit where it's yes um, I, yeah i know exactly what you're talking about yeah but like yeah, that's you, a skit you know that, the one i'm talking yeah, about i don't want to say it, but, yeah you know. he stopped doing that skit completely that was so a couple things one that was a funny skit two chris rock's not racist i don't i don't think he is he's never given any indication for you to believe so i'm not just saying because he's black he's not racist but i've never seen him act racist or do anything racist so we all know that he's not racist and, and we all know that um you know the skit was obviously funny it was one of his funniest skits um but you know should he not be allowed to say that like he doesn't think he wants to anymore, but nobody was calling him racist. So this, it's a, so this is still like a really hotly contested area. And what are you allowed to joke about? What are you, you know, what what should be joked about? Like, this, it's a very, very strange area. Like, I'm of the mindset that I probably think that in five to ten years, I'll probably believe that all satire just shouldn't exist because it's because at some point satirization becomes indistinguishable from the people that you're satirizing and you end up with an audience of people that <laughs> agree with you, uh, with your yeah. satire. Like, so I don't even know. But like, uh, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up that, that even the even the topic of what you should or shouldn't be allowed to joke about the responsibility of your audience, that's still something that's like really hotly contested, you know? Mm -hmm. No, and I agree totally there. And I mean, I got to be honest, as someone that's journalism, that's in incredibly, incredibly frustrating because one of the greatest points of decline in the country, in my opinion, I want to make that very clear, is the death of a civics education. And the democratization, oh man, can't pronounce shit. The democ, fuck it. Uh, democ, god damn, dude. Democratization? Wow. Is that? The democratization of media. Okay. Now, 
what I mean by that is, I mean, obviously new media has spread about, there are say, news outlets now. Mm-hmm. There are outlets for new, new media, like, you know, Twitch, things like you. And what that has done first off is it has vastly decreased the influence and power of legacy media outlets, which whatever gripes and there are valid gripes. And if you want, you can address some of those with me because holy shit. Um, there but these outlets you know generally work to the common good and so on and so forth wait today you would say that i don't think i would agree with that in the united states i'm, I'm sorry which that could media, you, that media outlets work different. to the common good i feel that they oh, have no a... i'm saying in, in the past now the oh. profit motive rules almost exclu- exclusively yeah exactly and there's yeah. some very interesting things about you know the profit motive and then resources impact and other discussions but i'm not sure that anyone in your chat is really going to care about these things that are essentially just things journalists talk about sure all right now um do you have any more thoughts on that leg of the conversation um no not really i don't think all right so i mean those are all the questions i prepared so now let's talk about your very against violence bit Uh now um i should preface this and say that my view of the world is based off of what is called a moral calculus so, and the basis for that system is essentially, and I use violence in the academic sense where it's harm done to any other person or group or so on. Now, that obviously has ranges. It could be very little harm or it can be, you know, assault, murder, genocide, so on and so on. Or it could be more abstract things like the sort of things we were talking about where you're creating a essentially a situation where homophobia or racism or whatever else can flourish. Mm -hmm. Pull a caveat. Um, I'm going to recommend that you read rising up and rising down. Um, You're not going to agree with the writer. It's essentially where I drew a large portion of this philosophy. Let's say, uh, very worth it. Very good writer, but moving on. So you said you're very against violence. Are you against violence in all situations? No, just in terms of uh, when, when it comes to political discourse, I'm against violence. I'm not like a pacifist or anything, though, and I believe in self-defense. Okay, fantastic. I'm very glad you believe in self-defense, first off, because that's yeah, fairly man. basic to my philosophy. Sure. <laughs> and, um, okay, so moving on to political violence, would you agree that politics in some sense can create, and I don't want to use the terms they use in or when they teach these things in college, but can create oppression, essentially? I don't... Maybe, yeah, in a very abstract way. I don't think politics themselves can, but politics can influence policy, which I think can. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now, this gets into a few of the complicated things, and this is one of the downfalls of the moral calculus in that no one is actually good enough to apply it, and since the truth is only that the truth exists, not that we know it, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's essentially impossible to apply accurately, which is unfortunate, but it makes for fun academic exercises. So there is this idea of... Uh, there are various other ones like Assault on Ground, uh, or rather, I should say defense of creed, defense of ground, so on, so on. Now, this would fall into probably the creed category, I want to say. And, I mean, that's one of the hazier ones, but essentially, at some point, it becomes just violent uprising against authority, against, you know, an assault, an attacker on your creed, I should say, becomes justified. Okay, no, so you're asking okay to... you're asking me when vi- or you're talking about when violence becomes okay when somebody is attacking your creed or your or your beliefs, I guess, or ideology. Yeah, to a certain degree, yes. Okay. Doesn't make it okay to punch someone that you disagree with in a face, in the face rather. Oh no! And if you're but... asking me, in my opinion, no, I would disagree. No, I don't think so. What, is that where we disagree? Well, it's not necessarily a disagreement. This is just an academic exercise. Oh, okay, yeah. Then, I mean, no, I would I would say no. I don't think anybody should be able to attack anybody over their creeds or their ideas. 
Okay. Now, what happens when someone attacks your creed? Um, then you'd speak I back? I feel like when I say that... Mm -hmm. No, I feel like when I say that, that's what you might get. But I feel like a more accurate... Do you? Are you familiar with uh, what's going on in Turkey? Um, some memes are going on with the uh, Erdogan guy. I don't know exactly what's... Um, didn't, he, did, didn't he just do like a referendum or something to influence how future voting would go or something? I'm not entirely sure. Yes, and this is maybe not the best example because this goes into wow, things like, like def wow, he... defense against, uh, or rather, defense against authority and justification for violent revolution and so on and so on, mm -hmm. which are, you know, again, too complicated to do. But, so essentially, after the coup attempt in Turkey, which, you know, Turkey has coups every sure. however many years. Sure. But yeah, so after the coup attempt... Erdogan essentially went on a rampage jailing members of the opposition, journalists who were either favorable to the opposition or, you know, reported neutrally or in ways that were unflattering to Erdogan. And he also went after university professors who did the same. And he also went after party leaders. Now, the referendum that you mentioned is very important because that's what this all leads up to. Mm-hmm. So after massive interferences with the opposition and essentially him doing everything he possibly could, he won the referendum. Now, you could frame the institution of, fuck, what are they calling it? Is it um, like democratic authoritarianism or something like that? Uh -huh. I don't know. That's not their term. It's, uh, I think, like a constant uh, – it doesn't matter. Presidential democracy is what I think it is. Okay. Something like that. It doesn't matter. Um, so – that you can frame as an assault on you know the Turkish institutions that are essentially destroying the Turkish government. The Turkish Supreme Court is probably just – or the judiciary, I should say, is probably just non-existent or non-functional at this point. In that case, the violence that you know actually happened where PKK supporters or AKP supporters are being attacked for their beliefs, aside, that aside – do you think that justifies a violent uprising? Um, so was the referendum election was that a fair vote or was it rigged or something? Do you, I'm not familiar with like how Turkey how good Turkey's political process should be fairly good, right? They're not like rigging elections or anything, are they? Well, it's I can't say that it's rigged in so much as you know someone's stuffing the ballot box, but again, you had essentially pro-government forces jailing opposition politicians, jailing any journalists. Mm -hmm. that may have been favorable to them they turkey or media in turkey is very much state controlled like uh you probably don't read any turkish media because why the fuck would anybody many of the outlets are essentially mouthpieces for the turkish government and even within the last few years many of those outlets have been taken over by the turkish government where they literally came into the newsroom and you know ousted the editors sure um, I, I mean, like, so if, if, if your country is literally now, being taken over against the will of the people, then, yeah, I think you have a right to a violent uprising. But, here, sure. but here's the question. Is it against the will of the people? Well, I, that's, why I'm that asking, we that's why I'm so asking it's... if the election was rigged or not. <laughs> was it... No, yeah, I, I, I understand where you're coming from, but, yeah, like, these are the things that get dealt with in real world. Met situations are messy. We don't necessarily, we can't necessarily say. Mm hmm I, that, I mean, if people believe you know, the that election the, was rigged, quote unquote. If people believe the election was rigged, then yeah, sure, I guess that would be enough to. If if you have good evidence or feel on good faith that the election was actually rigged, then sure, I guess I would give you right in my eyes to a violent uprising. Okay, so we come back to the point of perception then, right? Uh huh. Very good. Good. Okay. All right. But but I I think yeah, so we're I mean, very that's... far removed from punching Nazis in the street, though. Like I think that's very far removed from that. We're very far removed from that. Yeah. And, I mean, again, this is a hypothetical in so much as we're discounting various things and in so much as, again, the truth is that the truth exists, not that we know what the truth is. Sure. But um, that, but that's the big problem when people talk about political violence. Like, you, you say that, and that's true. The truth exists, and, and our goal is to get closer and closer to it, but nobody has absolute hand on, on what it is. 
But the problem when you talk about justifying political violence against people that are against your creed, who are you to say, you know, which creeds are worth defending with violence and which aren't, right? Like, we don't want to live in a society, especially in the United oh, States. Oh, you hit it right on the head, but go on. Yeah, well, I mean, like, because we live in a society in the United States. Now, this might not be true of every single country, so I'm only going to speak for the entire, in the United States. But in the United States, okay. we're supposed to have, or not supposed to, but we have diversity of thought. There are people that believe very different things, right? So who are you to say that, you know, one particular ideology is wrong and warrants violence unless you are claiming that you somehow have a hand on 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 absolute moral truth like who are you to say that the nazi is wrong um and who are you to say that or, or you know like maybe the nazi feels that he's justified and that certain people should be eradicated you know maybe that's that is his idea who's to say that one is wrong or one is right you know in, in this land we kind of have to live with diversity of thought and unless somebody is actually going as far as to infringe upon your rights that we all agree exist you can't really do anything to hurt him because the government doesn't recognize you know that, that there is one absolute correct way of thinking as long as it's in line with our current legal system all right i, I just want to make clear uh i hope that you're using the you as in like the hypothetical you and not ascribing these beliefs to me oh right? yeah no, no yeah oh yeah i'm just saying you yeah yeah and i mean i would very much agree with that, and I want to ask you what you think the limits of the majority are in this situation. Um, we have in the United States um, protections in our Constitution that are there to protect the rights of the minority. I would hope that those will always be defended for, and I would hope that the majority always recognizes the necessity of protecting the minority there. Um, but I guess if at one point the majority decides to say fuck it and, and screw over the minority, I mean, the minority would have a right to a violent uprising, and I guess we would go from there. <laughs> but, I mean, so far right, it seems given like... That, yeah. Given that, how do you feel about the Senate implementing the nuclear option regarding the, uh, the Supreme Court nominations? I, um, all of these things are, are so complicated. Um, you, you can maybe give me some more background here if you're more familiar with it. So I'm, I'm aware that, um, so let me summarize this to the best of my abilities. Um, basically, yeah. the um, Democrats were saying that they weren't going to hold a vote on the Gorsuch uh, nomination. And then the Republican dude said, fuck you, we're going to hold it anyway, even if you don't want us to by doing the nuclear option, I guess, bypassing or ignoring um, courtesy or whatever. Um, but I was under the I, I feel like I've read once that 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 nuclear option is only necessary because the Democrats made it possible to filibuster um, Supreme Court nominees during Obama's term. Is that true or not? Or that's not quite right. So what made it possible for the nuclear option is mm -hmm. essentially under Obama, the Democrats removed or they essentially implemented the nuclear option, but for lower level judicial appointees. Okay. So Obama had a bunch of federal judges waiting for confirmations, essentially, that mm -hmm. he couldn't get a vote on because, you know, the Senate wanted to be obstructionist, which, you know, they always do when they don't have a majority. Sure. And yeah, so they did that and they opened the door. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Then it goes in line with what yeah. I've read. I mean, well, I mean, damn, I mean, you made your bed. Now you have to sleep in it. I mean, I don't know. It's hard to feel bad for him if that's the case. Like... I don't know. I mean, firstly, you just got to respect the fucking political maneuvering that went down with Merrick Garland. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that the political situation in the United States right now is, is, is really fucked for a lot of different reasons. Um, but the entire, everything that went on with Brexit and everything that's going on in the United States right now is, um, makes me wonder uh, about the merits of democracy. I'm not sure. I mean, that's obviously a much more broad conversation, but given people's abilities to be so easily manipulated at levels that are currently unimaginable, right? The idea is that we could, um, the idea is that we could spread fake news on platforms like Facebook, and that could have a major determining factor in the election of the United States of America is pretty unbelievable. That's insane to me. Um, there are people that, that are running around that believe that Hillary Clinton and John Podesta, you know, visit some dude doing seances and, and fuck children and eat pizza and, like, and some crazy fucking <laughs> shit. And there are a scary number of people that believe this is real. Right. Or there are people that believe yeah. that, um, that 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 I, I guess much like Russia tried to do a long time ago or re re succeeded in doing is the idea that every single media platform is the same, that CNN is fake news the same way that Alex Jones is fake news, that all of these media platforms are, are exactly equal that AP and Reuters you know do just as good reporting as Lauren Southern from Rebel Media or Tommy Lauren from The Blaze that all of these things become equal because they say things that you don't agree with like we've taken um we've taken um confirmation bias up to like levels previously thought unbelievable 
Yeah, no, and I mean, I've mentioned this in your chat before, but you would be absolutely astounded at the amount of mail that I get, you know, calling me fake news. And Oh, I wouldn't be astounded. I, I could believe anything. At this point, I would believe anything. Um, so there's there's like a saying, like, you, you'll never go bankrupt um, gambling on the stupidity of the American people or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would extend that to the people in general. I don't know if there's oh, any yeah. reason oh, yeah, to yeah. single out Americans. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, we yeah, saw uh, it in Great Britain, or the United Kingdom to some extent as well, so I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, you mentioned fake news, and it spread over Facebook, and this isn't necessarily related to anything other than that, mm -hmm. but it's so incredibly easy for these people to do this. And the reason for that is these essentially spam accounts on Facebook or Twitter are so so cheap i could literally buy right now for nine hundred dollars mm -hmm. not really any way to stop it because similarly to how um so i just you know, similar I dis to how viruses have existed for the last 30 years i disagree oh, with on, that i don't i don't think that that's the important part um i do agree that you can buy fake well you know buy bots to spread fake news or whatever but that's not the story to me. That's not the important part to me. The, the fact of the matter is that it works. That's why people do it. Um, humans are prone to something. Uh, I, mean, I brought the term up earlier, right? Humans are prone to something called confirmation bias, right? If we believe in a certain yep. thing, we're more likely to seek out information that agrees with that. I think that the internet has given us an unprecedented opportunity to satisfy that bias in the worst way possible. Whatever crazy fucking idea you have, whatever stupid thought is floating in your head, whatever unsubstantiated claim you have, you can find a group of people on the internet that agree with you, no matter what. You never have to challenge your ideas. You never have to change your mind. You never have to be confronted with uncomfortable data or uncomfortable facts. You know, and, and you just go on the internet and you find people that agree with you. And I think that this is a fucking cancer. I think that this is one of the worst things that people do. I, I go out of my way, and I even get flat from my audience sometimes I go out of my way as much as possible to stay away from all forms of circle jerk I think that is where intellectuality goes to die and I extend this even to my fucking hobbies I don't even go to that um, PC master race subreddit right because the only way that those people can be happy is if they're shitting on consoles like it's so fucking stupid mm -hmm. like people's people's tendencies to find people that agree with them and then circle jerk their opinions until they've made like a perpetual energy machine out of the jerking of themselves and fly off to the sun in some fantasy land is, is insane it's insane to me so I understand that people can buy fake Fake news and spread it easily but I the, the the damaging thing to me isn't that people can do it it's that people will listen to it and, and then parrot it themselves you know um, for instance that hit piece video that was made about me um, there were no bots made to spread that but I still get people calling me a communist and a pedophile and uh, and you know and a, a bunch of crazy shit all the time on my fucking social media feed and nobody paid for that to be spread around people just see something about somebody that they don't like and they want to believe it instantly without questioning it I don't know if you've seen this happen dude I don't know if you've seen this oh, happen. No, I, I've even um, seen data like i've seen this during the election i saw this play out with evangelicals in real time mm -hmm. as the campaign went on there's this idea of um motivated reasoning which is it's similar to confirmation bias but it's more from the other direction essentially so instead of seeing something that aligns with your beliefs and believing it without giving it any critical thought you and they exhibit certain qualities or they don't exhibit certain qualities. And I don't have the poll numbers for this like on hand, but essentially the way it worked out was before or even early in 2016, Christian evangelicals from, you know, some demographic said by, I think like an 80 point margin, that being a moral upstanding person was a mandatory qualification for being a good president. Do you want to know what those numbers said in late October? That for you being a good person to be president? Yeah. So essentially, like, that was a, a necessary quality. Oh. What What were they? Uh, it flipped, and I think it was something like 70-30 in favor of it's not important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not surprising or... to me now, sure. I Look at the whole Republican change. Um, 
I know that you're younger, but damn, dude, when I grew up listening to my mom talk about how Russia was literally going to fucking take over the world and how much the Republican right. Party fucking hated Russia. And now you have the president of the United States, who is a Republican, who just can't stop praising Putin no matter what. And he can't ever find himself ever. I Unless I've missed it, I have never once heard Trump utter a single negative thing about that country. He's praised their elections. He's praised Putin as being a strong leader. He's praised Putin somehow, I guess, reviving their economy. I mean, like he's like he can't stop himself from saying nice things about him. Um, I don't know. I think that's very interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, there's been a sort of a tail turn with that from the administration, but I do believe that you're right, and I don't think Trump has turned on that in any way. He'll just personally. as soon as he talks to somebody, he'll tell him it's a bad too. idea. I'm sure he'll change his mind in two seconds because he has no real fucking opinions about anything. Um, the thing now, the see, thing, with with a comment like that, uh -huh. like. I know this has been reported in the media, but this is not something that really anyone knows. Like, right. I know people have sources within the administration that say that, you know, Trump listens to the last person he spoke to. Yeah. But, you know, th that's a belief that I wouldn't let yourself get so invested in. Like, I don't read the White House intrigues shit anymore because it's it has no value. It's commodity news, essentially. Sure. I mean, to me, it seems my biggest criticism of Trump, because I consider myself to be a somewhat intellectual person and I value intellectual honesty and intellectuality. These are things that are important to me. My biggest criticism of Trump since the very fucking start is that I consider Trump to be a stupid person, not like a rude, crass or, um, you know, uninformed about a particular issue, blah, blah, blah. I mean, he might be all of these things, but I, I genuinely do believe that Trump is legitimately very stupid. I think he is. Um, Any time I listen to him stumble through any of these conversations on policy, um, it's just cringeworthy. I feel like I'm listening to kind of a teenager, um, kind of, you know, they've thought about like, you know, like, well, what do you think about war? Um... Well, I think it's really <laughs> dumb when our generals tell him that we're coming ahead of time. That's so dumb, right? Because then they know we're coming, right? And they, and like he finds himself like halfway through his thoughts, like, yeah, that's a good idea. Like, what do you think about killing, you know, terrorists and their families? Like, um, I mean, yeah, yeah let's sure, do it. yeah, <laughs> yeah, fuck yeah, actually, yeah, let's kill them all, yeah, kill the fucking families of terror. Like he just like yeah, just everything he says just reeks of like ignorance. Like he has no fucking idea. What do you, and then like sometimes like the next day he'll be like, oh, you know, I talked to some of my generals and yeah, maybe we shouldn't torture people, I guess. And it's like he seems very wishy washy in all of his opinions and yeah I don't, trump just comes off as being somebody that's just very 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 unintelligent to me so that's why I, I i would be very easy to buy into the idea that he doesn't very feel very strongly about any of his opinions um you know because i don't think he knows enough to feel very strongly about any of his opinions and i mean that's something that i would say that we have some degree of empirical evidence for because it's what three months into the administration now and we have essentially zero policy specifics he's <laughs> his entire honeymoon period out of <laughs> he made an enemy of everybody no he, of every yeah. fucking everything he turned the whole ic against him why would you do this as a pre of, of the fucking military of everybody in he, like, he made enemies out of every single fucking person and he managed to how do you piss off the fucking leader of australia like what like just the dumbest fucking he, things not shaking <laughs> theresa oh may's God. hand like just the dumbest oh. shit he constantly why are we like five days after his election Spicer is still coming out to tell us that the inauguration was the largest one ever. Like, why are we talking about this shit? Like, yeah, I don't know. I, I just don't consider Trump to be very intelligent. I don't know. I don't know. No, yeah. And, I mean, we, we could talk about this forever, but... um. Yeah. <laughs> I do oh, want to real, move back a little bit. Yeah, real quick, in terms of what we were talking before about that confirmation bias, um, if you want to do good investigative journalism and you want the best fact-checking you will ever get, go post an article in a community that disagrees with the conclusion and you will see investigative journalism like you've never believed before. So there will be a oh, no, subreddit. Go, 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 go. There will be a subreddit <laughs> called like Pussy Pass Denied or whatever, right? And this is a subreddit where a woman does something dumb and she, and she gets punished for it, right? So you can post like, here is a Daily Mail link. Oh, look at this fucking dumb bitch. Like, oh, yeah, she got fucked. Here's a, the Sun link. Oh, wow, look at this fucking stupid bitch. Like, oh, God, here's a Daily Wire link. Oh, my God, here's a Breitbart link. Ha, <laughs> what a dumb bitch. Um, here's a link from the Wall Street Journal showing this or this or this. Like, well, hold on one second. If you look at the, uh, the, 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 the author of this article actually has ties to a media organization that's actually paid for a company that he worked with five years prior to that, and he references something, and it's like, holy fuck, like, well, now we're gonna become like, like, when you post something with a conclusion that people don't like, they will analyze and overanalyze the fuck out of every single part of that article. And, they, and it's like, oh my God, like investigative journals on a level you've never seen before. But like when you post like blog shit, blog spam sites saying, by the way, we just uncovered the sixth corpse that was raped by Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky was there taking pictures of it people are like oh yeah that definitely happened for sure and they like don't even question it at all yeah yeah I, j I do just want to 
contraband your definition of investigative journalism. Yeah, no, right? I say that very meanly. Like, I, uh, but I, I mean, I should say like being like hypercritical or even overcritical of sources like only happens when that source disagrees with what you say. Yeah, no, fully. And I want to kind of kind of to go back to the the spam bot stuff. This is why these worked. Like, this is why fake news was able to spread this because Facebook's Hi, detection Steven. method for fake accounts. Essentially, the way they thought an account was real is they looked for, this might not be the exact term, but positive interaction. So that's something like, you know, oh, like sharing or a link share or, or commenting on a page or whatever. Mm -hmm. And massive shares, they were get, getting a fuck ton of comments and so on and so on. So, I mean, this certainly is a huge problem. And the only possible way that we're going to be able to fight it, and it probably won't even work, is media literacy but again probably isn't gonna work yeah education something in the schools with, with being able to like i did like i literally like lauren southern has has um has has do you know who lauren southern is no i don't she has white house credentials now she was a reporter for the rebel media she's like a young 21 year old hot blonde chick who they have like talking mm -hmm. and doing journalist piece like doesn't understand like data collection right so she thinks that she can go to an area and talk to people and that those people will be a representative cross-sectional sample of everything going on in that city Holy right? shit. yeah but there are a lot of people that believe this what and i and i and one of the most painful things about my discussions are when i start talking to people i realize that we're on we're on i have to go down so many levels to communicate ideas like you, you like i'm talking to people that literally believe that if i go to a city and i talk to five people i can figure out what's going on in the city right a, a quote that lauren southern used against me in our debate she said oh well destiny data is just the plural of anecdote like no <laughs> the, the data collection is a science in and of itself like getting good representative cross-sectional data and I, and I remember reading and studying so much about polling and the difficulties of polling in schools um and how like even the difference between how you phrase a question um whether or not you no, poll no, people by telephone is... like these are all like incredibly complicated areas and this is somebody who thinks and there are lots of people that think this that well i saw a video of a riot once in malmo sweden so that whole fucking country must be falling apart like, dude that's one riot or protest from one day from one section in one neighborhood in one city like dude like chill like how how and the, and the people not real or how many people think that economics is a zero-sum game if there is a winner in an economic trade there is a loser and everything balances out to zero at the end there are oh a lot God. of people absolute advantages taught in fucking the first macro class you will ever fucking take see it's and that's what i basic shit that's what i think right and I, and I have a lot of people and even you to some extent have, have come to me and say like oh destiny i think you're very intelligent i think you're very well spoken and it's like i mean sure and i feel that way now but i'm only repeating things that i learned in high school like these are very very basic things. but the fact that this escapes so many people like it it yeah, it's not a it's not a good thing that that so many people are so easily swayed by so many bad numbers, by bad reporting, by bad data, by by not being critical of what they're being told, by um yeah, all of that is is just really 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 disturbing to me. All right, I got two things I want to throw at you. Mm -hmm. One is just sort of reinfor reinforcing that whole data collection point. Yeah. So, I'm working on an investigative story not for the mainstream outlet, it's for um like a statewide and it, it's, it's essentially housing in the, a housing investigation in one particular city. So there are a few populations I'm focused on, one particular one of them that has, I don't know, maybe like six or so thousand housing units in the city. Okay. Discuss a way to conduct surveys, like, you know, ideally. What First, are you trying, we have to... Or what are you trying to survey? Just... I mean, it's, it's in general just like housing problems. So... M Almost all these people are going to be renters. Uh -huh. And, you know, what problems have they had with the housing? Are there broken doors, broken windows? Oh, gotcha. Do things not lock? Are there leaks? Are there molds? So on, so on. Or overcrowding is also a big one. Like that, before I even started doing any of the polling, the fucking uh, city official just straight up admitted that overcrowding was like rampant. Uh, but yeah, so with my editor, I had to discuss how are we going to phrase the questions? We actually went and talked to a pollster. You know, we had a professional pollster instruct us on how to phrase these questions. We also had them talk to us about how we were going to collect the data. Now, we ended up doing it over the internet just because, you know, <laughs> journalism, the, the money's kind of tight right now. 
Uh, but yeah, so we did it online. Got it. How we're going to publicize it, the type of wording that we're going to use in there. So this is all very important. Now, moving on from that completely, that conversation is done. I wrote an article, again, towards the tail end of October, where it was a bunch of pollsters talking about polling. And the thing to realize here is that polling is a science, yes, but pollsters do not understand error at all. And they will tell you this. They will straight up say, we think this is what is going to happen. We could be totally wrong. Sure. That's really it. That's like, again, just two things I want to add. Okay. Gotcha. I've reached the end of my pad or the portion of my pad that has words on it. Do you have anything you want to take me to task for? Um, I not really that I can think of, I guess. What is your, um, do you do like, um, you just, you write articles essentially or? Uh, various multimedia shit, but yeah, mainly just to print. I don't like TV as a medium. It's very, very limited. Gotcha. Um, and I mean, I say take me to task, but if there are any things that you feel like the the industry does poorly, then I mean, feel free to say that, and I will either try to give a justification or state that one does not exist. Oh well, I mean, obviously, we know that the media completely fucked up their handling of the election, <laughs> right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm gonna blame the profit motive there. Um, there's also the issue of you know, generational memory. So you'll notice a lot of the times when there is, you know, a new president coming in, a lot of the reporters that come in are also just fresh. Mm -hmm. So the problem with political journalism is that there is this very high turnover because there's a lot of travel involved, especially during a campaign. Keep up, whereas a 50 year old reporter who's, you know, sat through for X amount of administrations is not going to. I mean, there are, of course, exceptions like Andrea Mitchell has been around for forever and, you know, she does a good job. But other than that, you know, there are fairly few. That, and obviously, that doesn't excuse us and that doesn't excuse the type of false equivalency that went on the election, just the type of focus on nonsense. Like, I'm going to say, from WikiLeaks... For, or rather, I should say from, no, yeah, from WikiLeaks, the only actual thing that came out that had any sort of journalistic value were the speech transcripts. That was it. That was the only thing. Sure. But, again, because people either want to believe whatever they want to believe or because they don't understand what means what. Like a lot of the communications between campaign personnel and journalists, the, I know it doesn't look right, but that stuff's all very routine. Like. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. I, yeah, yeah, I understood that. I, I figured yeah. that at the start. Like, people are like, oh, my God, can you believe that people in uh, people in the, the DNC were contacting CNN and giving them advice on, like, how to run their... Yeah, I mean, I'm sure those kinds yeah, of relationships was, exist throughout to all, feed all of the media. To like, line, like. Yeah, of course. Like, yeah. to make sure the messaging is consistent, to make sure that your contacts are... You still have access and everything. Like, yeah, like, yeah, that's pretty fucking huh. standard shit. Um, this is one of the big crimes. This is one of the big reasons why I was mad that nothing got linked on the Republican side, right? And that's why I huh. hate all the fucking idiots that were talking about transparency and it's great that we got transparency for once in our system oh, transparency. Like, transparency on one side is not transparency it's borderline propaganda okay if you have two child rapists running for two murderers <laughs> running for president okay and you find out about one of them being a murderer so you all flock together that's not transparency that's fucking propaganda dog like if you don't have it in all areas on both sides you're not getting transparency somebody's just feeding you a fucking narrative and you're eating it hook line and sinker yeah all right and just because you mentioned that and because i've done some reporting on this the obama administration was far and away they have leagues and leagues behind them and the next person they were far and away the least transparent administration in history the obama administration but they were awful oh sure i mean they i've surveilled heard... journalists they oh yeah all yeah. sorts of disclosures yeah um, what <laughs> the Trump administration is shaping up to be worse? 
Sure. They, and they probably like a, will be if they have the competency to do it. But um, I mean, that's a legitimate criticism that you could levy at a lot of mainstream media today is that the mainstream media was very much asleep. Um, you know, we've got all these reports now about Trump, you know, dropping that you know, or going to bomb that airport in Syria. Where the fuck was anybody talking about all of the military involvement in Syria when Obama was president? I don't remember hearing fucking almost anything about that from the mainstream media, all the bombing and shit and everything we did over there and supporting the groups and whatnot. Like, I don't remember hearing fuck all about any of that when Obama was president. Like, where was the reporting? No, yeah, I completely, completely agree with that. And I mean, in this situation, I have to give props to outlets like The Intercept that, I mean, they wrote a fucking book about this shit. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, I don't really care, but you know. Yeah. And even yeah, people no. saying things like there were no scandals under Obama and everything. Um, like, what about the fucking IRS? <laughs> like, like, oh, no, no, I was just going to bring that up. I was going to say, like, that actually seemed like a like one of the biggest deals to me that the IRS was targeting conservative organizations that's really fucking scary that's no, that, like that, if you want to that, talk about like some fast fascism tier shit like using part of the government to financially target groups that politically disagree with you that is a big fucking deal and it really didn't get that much airtime or play nobody really cared about it that much like <clears throat> no i would honestly go out on a limb and say that if i saw that in a list of articles of impeachment i'd just be like yeah okay that, that makes sense yeah that was a i don't know was that ever tied to obama directly or Obama's like kind of a cabinet or anything like that or was it just like a Democrat? I don't, I don't believe so. Last I remember they were just having committee hearings on it with the uh, the head of the IRS. I don't remember anyone from the actual administration getting roped into it, but I could be wrong there. I was working um local or statewide at that point. I don't really remember. Sure. Um the one big thing that bothers me about the media oh earlier because you guys gonna take you to task or whatever. The biggest yeah, thing yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you ever watch esports at all? Uh, I mean, yeah, I watch streams, so I guess so. You watch streams? Or, I mean, yeah, like. Do you watch like tournaments? Well, okay, not so much anymore, just because I work fucking like seventy hours a week. But uh, did you ever watch? Tournaments? Yeah, I'll watch uh like a Smash Bros. tournament. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Oh fuck, I don't know about this. the fighting game community. Um, well, I guess it's just Smash, so it's not fighting game. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, you can extend it. I've, I've sure. seen like LCS in the past as well. Basically, something that goes on in esports that um always bothered me and i don't think i hear it as much in like college football because it's really the only thing i listen to right but in, but in esports something that really bothered me was that um when people were when people are commenting a game okay and i knew this from starcraft i was a professional or semi-professional starcraft player when people are commenting a game player a will make an obvious mistake it is something that is that is purely bad it's just a bad it is strictly a bad yeah. action right and the commentators uh -huh. instead of saying like oh player a you know has made a blunder here or has made a mistake they'll always spin it and be like oh player a made a very um you know a very strange decision to do this or player a um you know like um you know did an attack here it might not be that effective or uh -huh. they made this and it's always kind of like a well okay that was actually like a big mistake like it's kind of weird that you would say it that way but they didn't really want to make anybody look bad i guess was kind of their that, that i think total biscuit say it's not my job to call a player out for making a mistake I noticed that the media does that. You guys do that with um, politicians. <laughs> the happiest no, yeah, moment. So... Did you watch all the debates or most of them? Yeah, I watched every single debate. The ha okay, all the way through. Good. Okay, then you'll know this. My favorite moment in all of the debates, in all of the debates that happened, I watched most of them, um, in all of the debates that happened, I believe this was a Republican debate when they were down to like, um, I want to say three, three to six people. I don't remember. It was getting to be one of the latest. But, um, Chris Wallace, I think, asked Trump, how are you going to um, shore up the, the shortfalls in Medicare or some shit? Um, and Trump's answer was something like, I'm going to eliminate the EPA, and that's how I'm going to blah, 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 right? And th these budget shortfalls were like on, on the scale of like, oh. huh, do you remember this? I don't remember this exact moment, but I know what the budget for the U.S. government looks like. So basically, I, I think the shortfalls for, for um, Medicaid, Medicare, old people's Medicare, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the shortfalls are, are, are somewhere. Or it's one of those. Two. I always mix these up. Fuck. But it's somewhere in the level of like hundreds of billions of dollars. Okay. And the annual budget for the EPA is like eight billion dollars. <laughs> so Trump's yeah. answer was fucking stupid. Uh, like every answer he's given, right? But so this is where ninety nine percent of the time the media go, okay, well I understand that, and then they move on. But then Chris Wallace brought up a picture. <laughs> 
of the budget of the EPA. <laughs> and so it was like this. It only happened. This is the only time this ever happened. But Trump actually got called out on a fact on a completely factual lie. He's completely being incorrect. And he got called out. And there was a graph right there. And I got to sit and watch him squirm around like the little uneducated fucking worm that he is to try to rationalize the stupid shit that he just said. And it was so good to watch it. It was so satisfying. Um, but it seems like nobody in the media is ever interested in like saying like, hey, you are wrong about this. Like unequivocally saying, not like, well, that's an interesting interpret or like, well, I could see, but instead of just being like, you're wrong about this. Can you reconcile this fact with your misinformation? People are starting to do it more now with Trump, especially when he was lying about his electoral college victory. Um, but like, yeah, I, I would love to see that kind of calling out way more by the media it would feel so much better. Yeah. I mean, first to start, Chris Wallace in the debates was a fucking legend mm -hmm. um, in that instance and also in the actual uh, general election debate that he moderated. He was, sure. Very good job. But to address your actual point, there's – to some degree, there's this tendency to – I mean, and moving back to the esports portion, there's this tendency to assume that the people in power or you know, the people playing the game know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not always supported and, you know, clearly in many situations, it's flat out wrong. Now to address the actual point about, you know, real time fact checking or calling people out, this goes back to some degree. And I want to be very clear to some degree, cause there are other factors, but this goes back a lot to access. So even yeah. in the debates, which is something that you have to consider, the candidates don't have to show up to the debate. The RNC doesn't have to give you the debate or the DNC doesn't have to give you the debate. And that's the that's so, a I mean, fucked just... up problem. This is the problem we have in games journalism, right? Somebody get I want an early copy of a game because I have a game media company. I can't give that game a bad review because if I give you a bad review, you're not going to send me an advanced copy anymore and I'm going to go fucking out of business. That's horrible. Fuck. <laughs> But, oh, yeah, but I, I imagine mean, it's it's the same thing. Because look at, um, didn't Megyn Kelly, aren't some people arguing that everything that's happened with her in regards to Trump might have pointed to, to her leaving? Do you think um, that... Uh, could, could you expand a little bit? You mean like with the... Well, because oh, Megyn oh, Kelly no, got into fights saying. with Trump a lot, and it was like a big thing where there are a lot of really vitriolic comments in the Republican Party and the Republican masses about Megyn Kelly being a traitor to the party and being unnecessarily um, unfair to Trump and whatnot, and, and Trump was parroting that opinion a lot. And, and I mean, I don't know, it seems like it led to a lot of rift between people talking about Megyn Kelly and whatnot, and, and now she's finally up and left Fox News. Do you think any of that kind of contributed to it, or do you think it completely disconnected, or...? No, it fully contributed, and I mean, this is something that gets forgotten a lot, or is maybe just not known by the general populace, but there, this happens every time there's a new president. The networks flush out unfriendly anchors, because again, they want that access. They want to get the first interview that you know the president, not the president-elect, does. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, this is very common, and the other thing that you have to understand, especially about the cable networks, is that they are fueled almost entirely by the profit motive yeah like if you go on their news sites they most clicks in most situations like if there's a big great breaking news item like we bombed syria that's going to go up top no matter what mm -hmm. i mean it's probably going to be performing the best as well but you know that it's not really important The um, I just those those moments in media are my favorite when you when you because these are the moments that are most important to us. Um, when Ted Koppel was talking to Sean Hannity <laughs> and said that his show was hurting America, <laughs> like these are the brutal, hard hitting moments. Or when um, or when John Stewart went on to Crossfire. Do you watch a lot of John Stewart stuff? Uh, John Stewart. I I watched The Daily Show when I was younger. I don't really watch any of his stuff anymore. The, just as an off thing, did you ever watch his interview with um Kramer? <sighs> Um, I honestly wouldn't be able to say. Uh, okay, okay, never mind. Um, but but like when John's, do you are you familiar with when John Stewart went into Crossfire and kind of dressed it down? Uh, Crossfire is what? Is that the that's the Fox show, right? It was an older Fox show. Oh shit! You should watch this sometime if you have the ability to. But just people being very frank and blunt and and, and speaking, you know, honesty. Um, like, yeah, I don't know. I feel like those are really really important things. And when I see it happen, it's very very refreshing to see it but it seems like in media today it's just it's not what you get whenever i see i still get a little boner um a little chubber when i see mark shep on fox news go off because it happens it's, it's been happening a few times where um you know when trump was trying to downplay the russian thing uh, mark shep was not having any of that he was very firmly 
stating that it is a problem and it needs to be looked into. And there was something somewhat recently um, where he had another one of those talks where he was very disappointed. It might have been with the president lying about his electoral victory um, yeah. and lying in general. No, like, yeah, that, it was either that or the crowd size. I don't remember. Which yeah, one. so it was one. Of, yeah, yeah, I think so. It was one of those two things. But like watching people um, get up and, and, and uh, what, speak truth to power or whatever. Um, yeah, that profit motive is just really shit. Like I, uh, yeah, I don't know. No, yeah, and I mean, fortunately, and I, I feel like I do have to talk to you about this now that I just remembered. But I remember mm -hmm. you saying this, this sort of a resurrection of journalism. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. In regards to uh, essentially the Washington Post and the New York oh, Times getting I'm sorry. a bunch of I kept subscriptions. Saying, I kept saying Mark Shep. I'm sorry, Shep Smith, Shepard Smith. Yeah, My bad. Sh yeah, yep. Go ahead. Don't worry, I got what you're talking yeah. about. But yeah, um, really is not the case because the, the health of the journalism industry isn't really dictated by how much or how many subscribers the new york times or the washington post gets the health of the journalism industry is dictated by how many reporters town has how many papers have state house reporters over in the capital it's stuff like this because and i mean i've seen pundits throw this out as well but essentially there is no greater time to be a corrupt politician than now simply because we don't have the resources to countermand it. The journalism industry has lost more workers than the coal industry has over the same period of time. I think it's like five or ten years or something like that. Sure. Literally more than half of the journalism jobs in legacy media have gone away. Newspaper publishing specifically. Sure. Yeah. And I mean that's – just a point to note, it, it obviously is great that these papers are doing better than their profits last year. Um, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I agree. Hey, are you an yeah. Okay. All right. You got anything else you want to toss at me? Um, no. I don't know. Maybe at some point, maybe in the future, a conversation on whether democracy is even valid. <laughs> because the fact <laughs> of the matter is, no matter how good of a job that you do, or no matter how good of a job you do, there are going to be a large number of people that will always just listen to what Alex Jones says instead of whatever is being reported by fake news like AP or Reuters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, actually, wait. One more quick thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, what, do you believe in markets, you've said, I believe? Yeah, I do. All right. To, to what extent? Are you, like, a full-on libertarian? Like, you got a hard-on for oh, no, I believe I believe in the power of the market. I think that it's a real thing, and it is an undeniable thing. It can, it can provide you with solutions, and in the right circumstances, it can give you great problems. But I, I just I believe in the power and the efficacy of the market, if that makes sense. Wait, hold on. I'm sorry. You got, wait, you got cut off. Can you say that again? Would, yeah, sure. Would you say markets are efficient, then? Um... I would say that generally, in the right circumstances, a market can be efficient. It would depend on the particular market, but... Why is my connection so shitty right now? I don't know, because you're a journalist? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't afford good internet, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, the U.S. economy specifically is now running into all these problems and i mean i say problems but they're not really regarded as such by a large portion of society mm -hmm. in that there are growing oligopolies and in some cases monopolies and there are pro-business regulations that are impeding new investment in various industries yep uh, planet money i don't know if you listen to them had a podcast out um sometime this week i think for things like cosmetologists mm -hmm. where you you know you need a fucking degree from a school to cut people's hair sure so i mean what i mean so i believe that a market so this is what i believe i believe that the market can deliver you good solutions okay. um more efficiently than a single entity with no competition can i believe in market i believe in market forces and i believe in all the powers of the market however i think that that market needs to be checked okay. by regulation from the government so if the market is telling the government what to do. I think you have a massive market failure there. I think that that's not good. Um, I think that probably if I could change one thing about politics in the United States, if there was, if I had to pick the single largest issue facing the United States, um, it, it was very easy to pick. It's the fact that um, politicians are forced to spend money to campaign. The fact that that pol that um, politicians can lobby and raise money from private corporations is the number one harming thing in the United States in all of politics right now. I think, like very, I think very easily above any other individual topic. Now, are you aware that there's a public funding campaign option? 
Um, when you do I, your taxes, it's on there. Yeah, you get I, like I a think, dollar. Sure, I, I, and I think that you have the ability to do public funding, but the amount of money available for that is so low, you would never be competitive in any election. Nope. No, yeah, that, that's the exact problem because yeah. they haven't changed it in like 50 years. Uh, no, it's literally like a few million, I think. It might be up to 100 million, but I mean, there were probably billions spent on the last election. Sure. Uh, unless you've got anything else, I think we're all done here. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, right. I think that's well, pretty it's been it. a pleasure. Yeah, I enjoy the conversation. Right. Have fun. Be careful. Stay safe. Yep. Oh, yeah, you too. Yeah, I'll see you later, buddy. Although I guess it's, it's probably pretty safe in Nebraska. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty safe. <laughs> All right, have a good one, man. Yeah, peace out.